Before we jump into today's video, there are a few things we wanted to clear up about our video on this transient life. While we enjoyed that film for its artistic vision and bold presentation, some of our viewers pointed out a few things in the comments. Tucker Myers, a longtime viewer and commenter, pointed out that we referred to the monk character, Ogino, as Ogina repeatedly. Honestly, I'm not sure how this slipped into the script, whether it was my scribbly handwriting while taking notes, or it was just an oversight on my part. Either way, this was a mistake. That hot boy's name is Ogino, not Ogina. Apologies for any confusion that resulted from this. Additionally, Tucker raised a bunch of really good points about the subtext and Buddhist undertones of this transient life that we didn't cover in our video. Tucker mentioned that this transient life is, in his opinion, one of, if not the most important film of the Japanese New Wave, and how personal it is to him. As such, he definitely had a different take on certain character motivations and aspects of the film's meta-narrative than us. Please check out his comment and the others under the video to get some other people's takes on the film. With this channel, we're always striving to present our interpretations of Japanese cinema, not to tell people how to think about films, but to offer one side. We highly encourage discussion in the comments section of our videos, as that's one of the key concerns of Cinema Nippon. If you have an interpretation that differs from ours, or more to add, please don't hold back from having these discussions below, and be sure to check out what others have already said. With all of that out of the way, let's dive into today's video, where we'll be looking at the second part of the Buddhist trilogy, Mandala, the portion which in all honesty was probably our least favorite, as well as the most dense in terms of messaging and subtext. This one will no doubt be a doozy. A year after the release of This Transient Life, Akio Jisoji put to screen the second portion of the Buddhist trilogy, Mandala. The film takes its name from the Sanskrit word for circle, which doubles as a Buddhist and Hindu symbol representing the universe. The mandala, appearing in a number of other cultures as well, seems to symbolize wholeness and unity. Perhaps appropriately, most of the crew from this transient life reappear here, forming a sort of wholeness and unity. We have Toshiro Ishiro, the writer on both films, Toro Fuyuki, the composer for both, Yuzo Inagaki, the cinematographer for both, and Noriyoshi Ikea, the art director on This Transient Life, as well as the production designer on Mandala and two-thirds of the Taisho trilogy. What's remarkable about Mandala, and that which is pretty obvious from the get-go, are the several differences between this film and its predecessor. Namely, Mandala was shot in color, mostly. We'll get to the juxtaposition of black and white alongside color later on. Furthermore, Mandala continues with Jisoji's experimentation in the visual space. The framing remains somewhat abstract here, playing with the perspective and relative size of characters and objects over the course of the film. While there are times that we are clued into who the characters are outside of the vacuum of this narrative based on their conversations, Jisoji and crew effectively display the social strata of the various characters as well as their individual personalities through visuals rather than verbally. As the production values on Mandala increased compared with this transient life, the narrative Jisoji was constructing grew more abstract. In a way, we see a parallel in abstraction between the Buddhist trilogy and Kiju Yoshida's contemporary trilogy. Specifically, the second film in both cases, Mandala and Heroic Purgatory, both showed an interest in contemporary politics as much as existentialism. Before we get into the politics of Mandala though, we ought to address the elephant in the room. We mentioned the changes in the visual space a moment ago, and there's one main point that we immediately notice outside of the film's use of color. Sex. Oodles and oodles of sex. The film revolves around a group who kidnap young adults and force them into sexual relationships with each other. Eventually, the group hikes into the wilderness to form an agrarian commune. One thing at a time, though. First, the sex. Mandala opens with stark images of full-color sex juxtaposed with sounds of the ocean. The male partner involved in this encounter comments that there's no real purpose in having sex with someone more than once. As the film progresses, we find that it revolves around multiple couples who don't remain consistent throughout. For political and existential reasons, they're made to swap partners multiple times over the film's runtime. For this reason, Mandala seems to explore the multifaceted nature of human sexual encounters. This applies, in just a few examples, to the violent nature of sex, the products of sex, and the effects of observing sex. Through the style and substance of Mandala we mentioned earlier, the film allows us to observe these most intimate moments between sexual partners. 
Not long into the film's runtime, however, this is flipped on us, and we're accused of being voyeurs, just like certain characters are in a more direct manner. As people are dragged into the sex cult's outpost and given to one another, the higher-ups outside of the bedroom observe the goings-on occurring within. In at least one of these scenarios, we are directly shown the leaders watching sexual acts on CCTV, thus directly drawing a parallel between these voyeurs and ourselves. Sex as power and violence is also explored in Mandala, specifically through the sexual abuse scene on the beach. In this incident, the cult runs down a young couple in the sand and assaults the two in order to draw them into the cult. This produces the desired effect of bringing them down to the cult's level. It also produces an unintended effect, however, which Mandala uses to explore the echoes of violence, specifically sexual violence. As collateral damage, the female victim's male partner seeks further gratification through similar sexual violence. Observing this action, he develops an interest in women who are quote-unquote corpses, as is explored later in the film. Of course, sex doesn't exist in a vacuum. If performed without contraception of some flavor, sex can result in reproduction, which the film addresses later on. Amidst all the sex and political commentary, the purpose and merits of children are questioned in a Zen garden. The visual space is manipulated here to show the similarity or difference of opinion between the two arguers, who agree on several points, but often also disagree. This is what we referred to earlier when we mentioned visual manipulation. The ideological distance between the two people becomes palpable thanks to the medium of cinema. At another point, a clock continues ticking as one of the women considers an abortion. The biological clock, as well as the clock representing the window for an abortion, literally echo as the morality of children and the morality of abortion are levied one after the other. Sex is a major part of Mandala, but perhaps the more important aspect of the film, or at least the element which sets it further from this transient life, is the film's exploration of later 60s and early 70s politics. We've discussed the history of the Japanese student political movement during this period in our video on heroic purgatory, which we encourage you to check out. As a surface summary, for the sake of context, during the 1950s and 1960s, the Japanese university student body saw a huge upsurge in political activism, specifically tending towards communism, anarchism, and socialism. This was facilitated by the organization Zengakuren, a student self-government group founded in 1948 which became a breeding ground for leftist ideology. By 1970, when Heroic Purgatory saw release, and in 1971, when Mandala first hit the screen, Zengakuren's influence was waning, but their legacy had grown to the point that it deserved examination. Films like the one on display today specifically cropped up to examine the successes and failures of the political hotbed that was the 22 years following Zengakuren's founding. In Mandala's case, Jisoji and company seemed interested primarily in examining how the leftist student movement might evolve as it petered out. By looking to the future, he reflexively looked to the past, investigating how specifically communism invoked religion, sectarianism, utopia, and nihilism. Before going into the darker parts, the film looks at what some of these communist student activities may see as the utopian ideal, a sense of egalitarianism explored primarily through agriculture and open sexuality, though ironically reached through explicit sexual violence. Both sex and farming are used to commune with the tribal commune's gods. Specifically, festivals are held for the harvest, and a specific member of the commune is selected as a sex partner and spirit medium for the gods. Outside of their small commune, however, the individual members are cast from society. Perhaps most pointedly, another group of communists throw out one of the lead characters, decrying him as a Trotskyite before chasing him off. According to Redebrick, big thanks for helping us understanding this better, Trotskyite is used as an epithet against communists who don't adhere to the party model of communism expounded by Stalinists and Maoists. These groups believe that a solid communist party is needed to establish a solid communist state, while Trotskyites, named after Leon Trotsky, himself seen as a traitor to the Soviet Union, are firmly in the wrong by rejecting the party model. The communist groups shown in the film mirror those in real life. They're chasing solidarity and uniformity, and in the process, they're forming schisms, which oppose one another on the details rather than the big picture. 
Through this shouting down of the Trotskyite traitor, the real world splits between 50s, 60s, and 70s leftists is displayed here. In a way, Mandala may be criticizing this sectarianism as it brings attention to how the character in question is pushed toward the commune indirectly by his condemnation at the hands of the others. Additionally, Mandala raises questions of religion and revolution, and more specifically how the two can be conflated. The commune's leader at one point states that whether someone is an atheist or not is irrelevant to the echoes of the gods in the world. This statement could be argued to effectively conflate late 60s Japanese communism with religion. The film may be insinuating that the communists believe, whether or not non-leftists saw it coming, that the working class and their oncoming revolution were unstoppable and inevitable. Whether this was the intention of the filmmakers, it's hard not to draw connections between communism present within the film and the religious aspects of the commune. The commune is established as a utopian agrarian society, though quickly things take a turn for the worst. One woman is selected as the channel for their gods, having sex with them day in and day out. Another woman witnesses this and wishes to take part in these activities, envying the shaman's level of clout. Falsely, the members of the commune are told that they're equal, but inequality appears prevalent to the outside observer. In one extreme case, this leads directly from religious zealotry in favor of communism to amoral nihilism. Represented by a repeated switch between monochrome and color photography, one specific conversation bears out the ideological divide between the communists and the nihilists. All is not well in the commune, yet the communists tend toward celebration and love for the gods. Meanwhile, the nihilist has come to view the world in stark contrast, asking pointedly whether this is indeed a utopia, or if it is rather a secret society. If communism will be the ideology to save humankind, why is the control test composed of such a small group? In implicitly raising points like this, specifically through the position-switching conversation, this ideological nihilism is shown to us sympathetically. The communists are viewed from his perspective as relatively well-off, college-educated young people who can afford to move into the woods, only to upheave their entire community and move once more. The leader even owns other land, meaning that if things go south, the group can simply move on. Compared to the idealistic vision the group's leader postulates as his point, and in keeping with what the nihilist believes, the college-age communist ideal is displayed as one big party that will continue no matter what. Again, this may not have been Jisoji and company's intent, but there's certainly an amount of overlap here between the commune in the film and the ideals of the previous decade's communist students. Perhaps Jisoji meant to draw attention to these iniquities. Ultimately, Mandala emerges feeling like a very bleak portrait and harsh criticism of late 60s Japanese communism, using the language and visuals of Buddhism. In moving the action from a modern hotel outpost to the woods, the film also pulls in imagery more akin to Shinto or a proprietary agrarian religion as well. This has the effect of making Mandala the furthest out there of the three films thematically. In a way, it echoes heroic purgatory, which itself seemed to be pretty nihilistic concerning the future of left-wing student revolt in Japan. We can't be entirely sure about Jisoji's intent, of course, especially when we came across a specific interview quote. Jisoji explained, when discussing the abstract nature of Mandala, quote, Mandala was created with my complete overconfidence in the filming of abstractions, and like how I used a wide lens throughout, it had many flaws, end quote. This may go away to explain how off-putting and bleak some aspects of the film are, as well as how esoteric some of it becomes, even compared to the other two films in the Buddhist trilogy. To be fair, tone-wise, things wouldn't be much better with the follow-up, Poem. That film may have a wider appeal thanks to removing Mandala's added layer of politics and returning to a more fundamental religious bent. Next time, we'll take a look at that film. As we said up top, if you have a take that differs from ours, let us know in the comments what you think about Mandala and the Buddhist trilogy at large. There's certainly a lot to unpack here, and we're sure that in some aspects, we've only scratched the surface.